Hi, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Neil. Welcome to Northwestern. And uh, I have a plan to weigh every protein in the human body. And that's what I'm here to share with you today. It's a big project. It's, it's very big. And how big? Well, it brings us into the realm of big science projects. And whether that be the moonshot many decades ago, or the Hubble Space Telescope more recently, that was about a $10 billion project with the fix. Uh, and more recently, moving into biology, you know, the Genome Project captures people's imagination, right? And decoded the three billion letters that make up our genetic code. So it's at that scale, big science. And these projects have direct effects, but also indirect effects that improve our daily lives in lots of ways unseen. And so into this mix, I bring the cell-based human proteome project, an idea to uh, catalog and determine a de the definitive set of protein molecules that builds up our bodies in layers. And uh, you know, when I socialize something on the order of a billion protein molecules and cataloging them, people have a few questions. <laughs> you know, uh, like, why would you do such a thing? And um, how might you do it? And, and when could it get done? And so let's take the preeminent question, you know, the why. That's a big one. So uh, there it is. So why? You know, I just have this coastal road in Norway to give you a sense about the future and where we're building, where are we growing in biomedical research. We have 84 years left in the century. What are some of the biggest goals this century? Well, we'll just drop out three, okay? So early and precise detection of disease. This is something that evades us now and something we'd love to be able to do because when you catch a disease early, it makes it awfully easier to fix it, right? And when we fix it, drug development, uh, interventions, therapies, these are very inefficient, actually, as a process. And how can we make that much more deterministic, much more efficient, especially when it works with uh, proteins and even using proteins? And then finally, regenerative medicine. If I want replacement organs or cells within my body and stem cells, you've heard it in the popular press, um, you know, how might we be able to do that decades earlier than what we might uh, uh, think is possible? And, I, and I'm here to say that this project would bring those goals into our grasp decades earlier by accomplishing this project. So that's the big why. But the science why causes us to uh, drill down into the science, OK? So let's go deeper. And a few weeks ago, I met my mother-in-law's, and she had these Russian dolls. Maybe you know them, babushka. And so yeah, I'm a middle-aged guy playing with dolls. But she, she was like, why are you so interested in this? I'm like, well, this is like the human body. We are built up in layers, right? And so if you took away our skin, what's inside? You see the liver and the heart uh, and the kidneys, et cetera, organs. And if you, if, you, if you look closer, you see the tissues of those organs. And then if you break out a microscope, you start to see the cells, OK? And the cellular level, that'll be important for today, obviously in a cell-based uh, proteome project. And then the proteins. If you shrink another 100-fold uh, smaller, and this slide is over a million-fold de decreased uh, size, you get to where we're going to spend some time together today on the cells and proteins in the body. And so it's layered, right? We're in layers and nested uh, layers of construction. So w one of the reasons of why is the direct, inexorable connection between proteins and disease. Um, you know, you may have recall your high school or middle uh, school uh, science class where you saw, OK, so DNA makes protein. And here I just represent proteins as beads on a string. And they are really complex in their nature. We'll learn something about that today. But also directly tied to disease and all our complex traits. Like here, an eye, the shape of the eye, the functioning of the eye, and then diseases of the eye. So uh, <clears throat> uh, the functioning of proteins can go wrong in many ways. And here, I just show a few of them to put it in your mind's eye, OK? So you can have too much or too little of a protein. Uh, you can have too short of a protein, no protein at all, or a kink that changes the function of the protein. And uh, we know something about this, right? But there's a piece of proteins-based science that we really have not charted out at all. And so it requires, well, requires us to go one level deeper. Come with me to that level here. Uh, you have uh, the fact that proteins fold up into shapes. And then really important for today is that they have all sorts of different decorations. So the purple and the green geometric shapes, what, what I'm trying to express there are these teeny tiny little molecules have these teeny tiny differences within them, creating families of proteins or different forms of these molecules. 
Amazingly, this world has never been charted out before. It's a wild frontier way beyond our current boundaries, and one in which I focus on today to try to map out a billion of these molecules all throughout the human body. And so uh, I'm going to use the, the word proteiforms for short as we move forward. And um, how might we do this project? Okay, how are we going to map out a billion of these things? And how did I get to that estimate? Well, let me tell you something about that. So it's in the name. It's about cells and proteins. Um, if you think about the blood, there are all sorts of different kinds of cells swimming through your body via the blood. And a good estimate is about 300 different kinds of cells swimming through your blood. And remember those, those Russian dolls, we're nested. We want to know the proteins, the proteiforms that are within each cell uh, type. And so it's, it's these two things that frame this project. And you have estimates for these. If we assume there's 4,000 cell types all throughout our bodies, and then uh, in each cell type, there are about a quarter of a million different proteiforms, distinct little molecules that need to be cataloged, um, then this frames the project. You multiply these two numbers, and you get to 1 billion uh, targeted molecules to catalog. And that's the frame of the project. And we, there are about a dozen or so uh, fluids in our body that would also be uh, in, in the project and marginally change that number. So that, but that's a good estimate. And so let's take each aspect in turn. So first, the cell types, and then how we're going to weigh them all. So we've never actually mapped out all the different kinds of cells in our body before. So how might one do this? And if you uh, think about cells, there are a couple hundred proteins that sit on the surface of cells. And like in the grocery store, where they have the barcodes, right, and you scan those things, uh, these proteins on the surface can serve as the bars of a barcode and define how uh, uh, cells are related to each other. And we can then read them out and even target them. And that'll come in just in a few minutes, the targeting piece. So this project would first systematically define all the kinds of cells in our body. And then the second major aspect of the project is how to weigh proteins. And this is something very near and dear to my heart, uh, also my lab here at Northwestern. Um, seems simple, right? Get a piece of scientific apparatus and weigh uh, a protein. Get a bunch of healthy people together, uh, look at the variants of all their different protein forms, and then do the same thing in, in certain disease populations and uh, tell the difference, where there are these different decorations that are so clearly related to disease. So, but this is not how proteomics is done. This idea of top-down proteomics, where you first weigh the whole protein, determine the molecular weight, which is really what I'm saying for you nerds in the audience. It's to determine the identity and composition of all the atoms in these molecules. And so we, 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 it is made possible to do this now. And this is a lot of what our lab does to make this possible and to make it cost effective. And this requires a major rework of how the world does proteomics today. And it's uh, one of the things that I'm really excited to be part of here at Northwestern. So OK, so uh, that gives you some sense about the two main aspects of the project and, and how it might go. Um, when might this occur? Um, that's an interesting uh, question. If, you, if you're with me so far, we can now think about uh, the process of, of, of the genome project okay, as a template for the win. So here I give you a graph. Uh, and pay attention to the orange line there. Okay? This graph spans about 20 years on the x-axis. And it, the drop in price is shown on the y-axis. And where those prices are listed in the middle, that's about when the genome project was completed. And you can see before in time, there was this magic moment where we reached a dollar per base to sequence the AGs, Cs, and Ts, that made the three billion of them that make up our body. And in the mid-90s, we reached that point. So that meant the three billion bases could be sequenced for $3 billion and defined you know, the, the, the cost of the project. So it's this time frame and template that I bring forward and say, well, let's just do that for protein molecules. Let's catalog them at a dollar per piece, and that frames the project. That means we've linked the private and public sectors together, just like in the Genome Project. And when you do this in our society, amazing things happen. You bring the best minds of the planet to the problem. Uh, computer scientists, chemists, biologists, physicians, statisticians, 
uh, it's an amazing thing that occurs. Young minds are sucked into an exciting project. Um, and this is, I think, what's needed to tackle the proteome, the, all the proteins that, that exist within us, and really start to domesticate what right now is a wild frontier uh, of unknown uh, aspects. So it, it's that uh, which frames the win. So in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, we might be able to, to accomplish this project if we get uh, busy with it. And let's now live in the world we've just created. Okay? So what, is that, what does that look like? What would this project bring in that amount of time, say in a decade or, or at the out, maybe 2030? So let's start with something that doesn't work today and how this would change. Okay? So the PSA test is something that we use screen men Prostate cancer, I'm getting interested in this myself at the age of 45. Prostate cancer, hmm, yes, I need a screen. What is the screen? It's a protein, PSA, and there's no secret but that this test is not very good, okay? And maybe you now know something about the why of that, right? This is naive to say there's one protein, PSA, the protein. No, there's a whole bunch of proteoforms. And if we got specific about measuring all of them, well, we already know there's over 100 of these things swimming around. And, and then maybe the test would be much more precise because the measurements based on them are also much more precise. And so that's the simple idea. And um, you know, that's just something that needs to be supercharged and tested uh, out in the wild of our population. Let me take another one, heart disease. Okay? So when you have enlargement of the heart over time, this is the beginning of, of cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure. You want to detect stage of disease in addition to just the presence of disease. Nothing in biology is, is digital uh, when it comes to proteins. And so here, you, you, you want to know stage of disease. Here you have uh, uh, the blood in intimate contact with the heart. We are frustrated right now in our goals to detect pre with precision someone's stroke or heart attack risk with, with much precision at all. So it's the same thing, protein molecules need to be domesticated. We know the variants of them in health and wellness, and then we can call disease with precision um, and confidence. And it's, it's that kind of future that I'd like to bring uh, into being. And so the other major goals for the century that I laid out at the outset, so drug development. Remember the uh, grocery store and the bars and the barcode where you're scanning? Turns out that that technology would be great to determine the cell surface proteins on the surface of cancer cells, and that would be a way to target them with what? But protein-based drugs. And in fact, this is one of the biggest growing sectors, fastest growing sectors in big pharmaceutical companies today, is the use of protein-based drugs and cell surface uh, targets of them. So it's an example of the kind of ripple effect, right? the indirect effects of, of, of bringing into the world new technologies and cost-effective technologies, like the radically cheap uh, genome sequencing that we can do today. So the final one is regenerative medicine here. Uh, you know, if, I, if our friends and families and neighbors want new organs uh, or even different cells, um, this is the idea of regenerative medicine. And I'll go ahead and be selfish, right? So uh, in the year 2050, I'm going to need a new heart because I'm burning through this one a little bit quickly, I think. Um, and, you know, so what's that going to take, right? You, you now know the human body is built up, organs are built up. Uh, hierarchically, right, in layers. And if we don't understand those layers with high precision, we're not going to be able to accomplish this goal uh, of creating a new organ if we don't know the cells and the protein forms within them. And, and so when someone creates a new organ, at least certainly personalized for my body or your body, then knowing the sort of Wikipedia or the reference list of known cells and proteins within them, you know, it's a key part to say, OK, you've got some good uh, construction principles here, and you've got yourself a new organ. So this is, this is the vision moving forward and why domesticating proteins and uh, making them not beyond our boundaries are a key part of the future. Um, so it's like the Genome Project, but for proteins. And it has to be different because proteins are different. They're not DNA. So back to this coastal road in Norway. Uh, the, you know, to your eye, you know, this looks maybe like a cliff or something like this. And what I'm proposing in protein-based science is to actually accelerate toward something that looks like this. Put on the gas pedal, imagine yourself driving to this, and, and when you do that in science and technology and you're on the right road, you're often rewarded. And it's not a cliff, it's a bridge. 
And on the other side, it doesn't look nearly so bad. It, in fact, looks beautiful. And uh, you know, getting to this point is uh, not always easy. All sorts of things may come even when you uh, actually get the project at production scale and moving nicely. Um, so, but it's something that really needs to uh, move forward. And, and in fact, we've already made it actionable. And if I can beg a few more seconds of your time, in three ways we've done that. We've got a consortium for top-down proteomics that's worldwide, about 400 members. We've got 20,000 proteiforms. Go us, right? That's on our way to a billion. Um, it's a long way from a billion, but it's a start. And then Paul Allen, who started Microsoft, he really looks, all his, his staff and him, they look for the earliest possible thing, maybe when it's quite small, um, like yours truly, and says, hmm, I wonder if that couldn't be big one day. And so we've gotten support from the Paul G. Allen Frontiers program to go ahead and begin this, get another 30,000 proteiforms from 10 uh, B cell uh, subtypes in the human blood, and so it's moving. Um, so in the end, you know, if we do this kind of thing, we can look back tell other, our next generation of people that we were courageous enough to launch it. it it's not that big of a gap. It, it's a bridge, you know, no problem, right? One day, um, uh, to, long ago, in hindsight, it doesn't look nearly as, as dangerous. So um, that's the plan for weighing every protein in the human body. I wanted to just uh, thank a couple of people here at Northwestern, certainly the TEDx organizing committee, uh, just tremendous job here. The Office of the President, Vice President, and Provost, uh, Office of Foundation Relations here at Northwestern, my group, my senior staff, particularly Paul, Phil, and Haley, Tim for helping me make these slides, the National Institutes of Health for funding my, my lab, and finally my family, and then you today, thanks for coming. <laughs>